So, if you're like me, this stuff right here is fairly confusing. I like beer. I'm trying to learn about wine, but honestly, I just buy stuff with cool labels. I really don't know what I'm doing. So, on our first, very first episode of that drinking show, we're going to teach you all about wine. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to the first episode of That Drinking Show. As the name says, it's a show about drinking. Uh, my name is Lee, and I have one of my partners in crime, Noel, with me tonight. How you doing? Hey, doing well. Excited to be on your first show. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll uh, see where this takes us. So, a little background. Um, we're just going to have fun drinking. We're going to try and teach you a few things, introduce you to some things uh, you might not know. Um, talk about trends, um, things that we see in the industry. So I'll let Noelle talk about her background, but she is quite accomplished in the wine industry, and I like to drink beer. So it's a great partnership. <laughs> um, so I live in Maryland and have a family here, born and raised here. As you can see, I'm a Baltimore fan all around. And as you can see over there, she went astray. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's been a wonderful part of our banter for many years. Uh, we've known each other since middle school. Um, Bates Junior was, High, it was called. Junior High, yes. We, we were so old that we went to a junior high school. <laughs> so here we are many years later, and we've uh, kind of parlayed our love of all things drinking into a little web series here. So, all right. So how about you tell us about your how you got into all this and what brought you into the wine world? Yeah, I've, gosh, it started a really long time ago, actually. Um, I was a high school science teacher. I actually taught at Annapolis High for a while, but uh, when I moved and I got to Florida, I changed careers and I became a certified SOM and was working in restaurants and helping out with writing wine lists and purchasing for restaurants and things like that. And then I said, heck, let's go try a harvest in Napa. And so that led me to my next career. <laughs> Worst places to end up just to go um, try something. I mean, you know, I, I did work for free the first time, uh, never again. Um, it's rough. Uh, harvest entails uh, some very long hours, uh, but it's uh, very educational. So I did come back with a ton of knowledge, um, but eventually I got out of the restaurant industry altogether and became a full-time cellar worker and lived in Napa and uh, made wine, helped make wine. I wasn't ever a head wine maker, but I did all the other stuff. And uh, eventually that led me to viticulture, um, which was definitely eye-opening to see the farming side of what makes these amazing bottles that we enjoy all the time. And that's where I am now. Uh, my husband and I left Napa um, two years ago and bought a vineyard in the middle of nowhere, Texas. <laughs> and that's where we are today. Hey, that's living the dream. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to leave Napa, you better find someplace nice. Uh, I am familiar with this area. I did go to Baylor, so um, I, I did know this part of the world. I lived in Austin for a little while, so um, it wasn't a shocker to me, although my husband had never lived anywhere but Sonoma and Marin County, so that was a little different for him, but oh, boy. he okay. loved it. We're all happy. <laughs> all right. Well, good. Yeah, so throughout the, the course of this show, we'll get into everything, and, and um, you know, I, I, I told her very early on, I love beer. I know a lot about beer. I know what I like to drink in beer and it's affordable. I didn't ever want to learn what good wine was because I think it's a dangerous hobby because you start really appreciating it and you want the really good stuff. So I've kept my taste buds in the dark about what good wine is. So this first episode, we're going to learn about wine. How's that? That sounds great. Perfect. I got a couple things to show you guys. In fact, I did send you a bottle. You did, and we are going to get to that. But first, most, more importantly, what are you drinking right now? 
I went old school for the show, something I grew up, well, not grew up, but uh, in my adult life, I uh, used to drink in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, this is an ice pick. Excellent. So what is in that for someone who may not know? So really, it's just unsweet tea, vodka, whatever, whatever um, sugar you want. I use uh, Trativa and then a uh, squirt of lemon. Usually if they make it out of the bar, they shake it up real good so that the sugar dissolves. And uh, yeah, I guess this was something we used to drink. I wanna say at O'Brien's often. Yeah. So now do you, are you a fan of the sweet tea vodka? <laughs> no, I, I, I guess I was a long time ago. I, I definitely like the drier stuff now. So that's why oh. I prefer to add my own sugar content. <laughs> nice bottle of Firefly and uh... One of the Arizona, I, I remember like, drinking those. Palmers, that there's nothing better. Yeah. I mean, you can only have a couple because you, it creeps up on you quickly. But yeah, that's and uh, those hangovers are pretty nasty too when it has that much sugar in it. So I like to stay away from that. Oh, Tom, you're killing me. You're killing me. Okay. All right. So I've got um, from Urban South. It's called Holy Roller, uh, hazy, juicy IPA. Just something simple for tonight. Um, yeah. All right. So. Uh, I can't get over that towel in the background. You're, you're killing me with that. Yeah. The shrine, well, to, the shrine to Heath. Heath. Yeah. And, um, and then um, TJ and Ben are here too. <laughs> no beard. Nice. All right. We'll leave them right there. Yeah, good. <laughs> All right. So a couple simple topics. I know that, you know, I went out with my wife. Now that we're going out for COVID again a little bit, we went out to a restaurant last weekend, just sat outside, kids stayed home, had some outdoor seating, and I had a beer and she ordered a wine. And it always comes down to the mm -hmm. same, okay, I'll take your house Chardonnay or bring me anything. So <laughs> we've all been to a restaurant, we've seen a wine list, we, you know, we've been with friends and had that panic set in, unless there's something that we recognize, which is highly unlikely. If we recognize it, it's probably not that good. So... <laughs> You know what you, you go to a restaurant what you know say it's a not a super high end but a, you know a nice sit down steakhouse something like that sure Help me through a restaurant wine list help me yes i mean they can be really intimidating especially if they hand you a giant book or an ipad they use these days for some things and you scroll through categories and um it can be really daunting there are a couple of solutions to that. Um, first, if it's a higher end restaurant, they usually will have a sommelier on staff. And that is an amazing free tool to use mm -hmm. in a restaurant to help you, guide you into um, maybe something that you've never had before that would be really interesting to try without um, having to kind of navigate that on your own. One thing I stay away from in restaurants is by the glass. And there's a couple reasons for it. Um, by the glass, you really don't know when that bottle was opened. And for me, if I have a one day old anything, I know it, I can taste it, and it's unfortunate. Yes, you can send it back and ask them to open a new bottle, but just to save a lot of time, I just go straight to bottle list, um, especially with sparkling wines by the glass. If you can imagine a two day old bottle of a Clicquot mm -hmm. or something that's sitting in the bar, you, that's just not something that's going to be really delicious for you. Now, would so, a restaurant keep a bottle of sparkling open for that long? Well, they have tools that they can help alleviate it going flat, but you can always tell. Once um, any kind of oxygen is added to a wine bottle, it will start to decrease in quality. Um, there is such thing as decanting where you do want to add air back in, but that's a very specific type of wine, and those types of wines usually aren't poured by the glass. So... Yeah. Me personally, I like to pick bottles um, unless you sit at the bar. A little trick about that is you can ask the bartender which bottles he has opened in the last hour. So there's another yeah. little trick right there. <laughs> but when you're looking at wine lists and um, it's kind of fun in the business world to be the person who gets to handle the wine list, like it's sent down the table to you because you're the most knowledgeable. It does give you a little bit um, of confidence, looking at that wine list, being able to pick something for the table, um, I think it's an impressive move. So a couple of things I like to kind of, uh, just little points to remember when you're picking out a wine for the table, you kind of want to have an idea as to if everybody's eating something similar. 
Right. If they're not, that's okay. But if everyone's doing fish or, or seafood, then you can pick sparkling wine or a white wine and feel pretty confident in that. If it's a mixed bag, just I would go with whatever you prefer. So when you're looking at the wine list, they're almost always in um, order of, of least expensive to most expensive. Not always, but a lot of times they are. When in doubt, pick something in the middle. Okay. That is an easy go-to rule. Don't ever pick the top one um, and don't really go down that list very far if you don't know that category. If you love Cabernet Sauvignon, just know that your price point is going to be a lot higher than say if you were going to pick a Syrah or something. So somewhere in the middle of the price list is a really good avenue. It's not going to be highest quality, but it certainly isn't going to be lowest. Price point wise, your markup in restaurants is sometimes 300%. Oh. <laughs> so when you, I know, I know. So when you look at something that you recognize in a store and you say, oh my gosh, that wine is only 80 bucks in the store, but it's 200 on the list. That's pretty normal. So, you know, you got to keep in mind that, that, you know, the experience of sharing that wine with that food is what that markup is about. So yes, you may not want to pick that everyday wine you see at the grocery store that you can get for 80 bucks. You may want to pick something that you don't see every day, something that's a little more special, but maybe in that same, you know, 80 to hundred dollar price range. It's tough. I'm not going to lie. The more um, foodie we get and, and we are as a country becoming so much more interested in pairing food with wine, with beer, there's tequila dinners. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff out there. Um, and so looking at a wine list, although daunting, really any category, throw it in the middle of the price range, you're going to find some deals in there and it'll be impressive. And always use your psalm. I cannot stress that enough. If you're at a restaurant that has one, it really is the best way to go. I mean, that was my old job. I loved it. Okay, let's say they don't have one and you, you know, you're at your, your neighborhood steakhouse and you're looking for a recommendation. Do you trust the yeah. staff? Do you ask for their recommendation of what they've had and liked? Definitely. Most steakhouse servers have some kind of pretty decent wine education behind them. Um, if they aren't certified Psalms themselves. So yes, definitely look to your server. And if they really are having um, a hard time trying to find something for you, you can always ask for a manager. All managers at those kinds of steakhouses have, they're probably the wine buyer if they don't have a Psalm on staff. So it's always, there. there's never um, a wrong time to ask for a manager if you have a question. This is one of the right times because you never want to send a bottle back. In fact, you shouldn't send it back if you don't like it. You really only send wine back if it's flawed, which is another point real quick to make. Always, if you have a Psalm on staff, I always have them try the wine first. I know that seems weird because you don't want to waste any of it, but really they're going to take an ounce or less That's to good. try it and make sure there aren't, there aren't any flaws in the wine. And then if there is a flaw, they will take care of it for you. Okay, awesome, love it. All right, so let's go through some common things you would order out at a nice restaurant and guide us down the path of some of the styles we should be ordering. So since we're talking about it, you're yeah. out on a nice steak. You want a hearty steak and potato and mashed potato and broccoli dinner. What am I getting? Yeah. Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, that's the number one go-to. If you're at a steakhouse, they probably have more of that category than anything else. And it's kind of the American go-to. I like to pick other fun stuff. I like Syrah. Now, Syrah and Shiraz are the same grape. It's just called Shiraz in Australia. So if you're a Shiraz fan, you're a Syrah fan, it's the same thing. That's another kind of big juicy wine that can handle a really nice steak. Um, both of those categories tend to be pretty large at steakhouses. If your wife loves Chardonnay, they usually have a pretty decent Chardonnay list at those kinds of restaurants too, because usually all of their appetizers are seafood because you're at a steakhouse. And so those tend to be nice pairings uh, with the beginning of the meal. Um, everyone knows Napa is very well known for Chardonnay and Cabernet, um, but you can also pick Washington State for those two varieties as well. And um, 
not to mention, you know, there are other varieties in, in the south part of California or, or mid part, I guess, that are doing really well too. Um, some bigger Syrahs out of that area. So California is kind of a go-to right now. I'd like to say eventually we'll start seeing more Texas or Virginia or Finger Lakes wines out there, but when in doubt, I mean, it's just an easy road to go. They're very experienced in making those kinds of high-end wines and you really don't mess up if you kind of just stick to that really easy script. Okay. I love Shiraz, that you say that. I like that peppery kind of little bit to it. It's got, yeah. we drink a lot of that. Yeah, over. and those can, those can really go with some of those fattier steaks like uh, ribeye or something, whereas cab can kind of seep in and out of filet mignon all the way to, to New York strip. But the bigger Shirazes and things, yeah, those fatty meats. That That's right, yeah, because it, 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 I've got this nice buttery, juicy steak. And I've got this you know, this wine is going to bite back at it. For me, I mean, I yeah. love Cabernet, but it, like you said, it kind of blends with it. I like the diversity of having the two different feels to it. So I'll go that yep. way when we, when we do steak. Okay. You mentioned seafood, but you have a nice yes. fish, fresh fish, you know, yeah. what do you get? So this comes down to preparation. Are you getting it poached? Are you getting it grilled? They do matter. Um, if it's a lighter style, like a poaching, then you stay with the lighter style wine. I'm, I'm a bubble head. I'm a, I'm a fanatic for sparkling wines. So for me, I'd go that route. I'd go champagne or some kind of domestic bubbles or Prosecco. Um, that would be a really nice pairing for a lighter style fish. If you're talking about like, um, a, like grilled shrimp or, a um, like a, a sea bass that's that's grilled or, or filleted or something, you definitely want to go the Chardonnay or bigger route, something that has a fuller mouthfeel. You want to kind of match the fish preparation style. And that's something people, um, I don't think they think about that. So it's always about the prep. You match the level of body with your wine. Um, and you know, if you're a fan of really light Pinot Noirs, Pinot Noirs, are kind of misunderstood. They're right in the middle, right? They're not quite a big old cab and they're not a little teeny uh, white wine. They can go either direction. You can go with white or red meat with Pinot. So, you know, that's kind of an easy one too. If you feel like you're stuck and there's people at the table and everyone's getting something different, Pinot Noir is a really nice kind of right down the middle wine that can go with lots of different stuff. Okay. Now, here's, a, here's a, another challenge. So like you said, people are becoming foodies more. We love food. We prepare a ton of food. We do a lot of small plates, charcuterie plates, yeah. all kinds of things. So something that we yeah. love, small plates restaurants. So what yes. would you recommend then if we, you know, we're going to go out to a place, let's just say it's Mediterranean themed, and we know we're going to cross across seafood and heavy sausage and probably some steak, mm -hmm. vegetarian you know, we've got all these different flavor profiles and all these different preparations and styles, you know, with your idea of, of you know, getting bottles, where is your happy middle ground knowing that you've got to cross all these, these spice profiles on your palate? And there are wines in the Mediterranean made specifically for these kinds of meals. Personally, when I know I'm going to have a bunch of very different items in a meal, like the small plates or maybe like um, some kind of potluck where everybody brings something different, um, I go with sparkling rosé. And there's a reason for that. The sparkling part is high acid, so that's going to clean your palate and keep things nice and fresh. Mm -hmm. So when you have heavy sausages or things like that, it cleanses your palate. And then you've got this kind of rosé style, which is still using the skins of red grapes. You still have a little bit of tannic structure in there, which can kind of also match some of those heavier foods. But the really um, effervescent side of sparkling wine can go with salads and um, the, ve the vegetable side of things too. So that's my go-to for a mixed bag of stuff. Um, I would I'd stay with sparkling if you don't like sparkling rosé, maybe something just a, a blanc de blanc or something, which is all Chardonnay, is what that means. Um, but anything that's sparkling can really hang with all those different types of food in one sitting. Okay. All right, so now I think I know your answer. So let's say we've gone through this big meal, the night's almost over and we want dessert. Yeah. So you've got, you know, you've got cakes, you've got mixed berries, pastries, ice cream, the full gamut. So mm -hmm. I, you know, what, what do you do with that situation? Do you, did I switch to the glass or do you have another bottle of bubbly for the table to get through dessert? 
I mean, you can go sparkling wine. I don't really do sweet with sweet. So if okay. I'm going to have a dessert, I'm going to do a, de a digestif probably. Um, I'm a big white Sambuca fan. So give me that white Sambuca shaken. So it's cloudy with three beans in it with my tiramisu. That's my perfect pairing. So you're already getting so much sugar in your dessert. Um, one of those espresso martinis or something is fine too. If you want to go that route wine, doesn't necessarily need to be in every course. And like, for me, I like cocktails before dinner, wine with dinner, and then that some kind of digestive at the end. So I don't necessarily do wine the whole time either. You kind of want to switch it up a little bit. If not, there are different dessert wines. If you wanted to go that route, um, there's also um, like Uzos and things. I mean, mm -hmm. these are all meant to be drank at the end of a meal and you'll see them on a dessert menu. They'll pick out certain things for you that are meant to be um, served at the end of the meal. And it's always fun to try the new different things that are on there, tawny ports, ruby ports. Mm -hmm. um, those are wine based. So I, I've, I like to dabble. Um, I'll just kind of pick something random and learn about it. And they're usually, you know, 10 bucks for a couple ounces. It's not that big of a deal if you hate it. And if you really, honestly, if you really hate it, you can tell your server and they'll let you pick something else. But um, I, I like to be a little more experimental at the end of my meal. I don't think another bottle is needed at that time, but that's, that's my own preference. If you want to get another bottle, go for it. Yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So that, that's a good, that's a good guide for, you know, I was saying, I want a nice martini before we sit down or, or you know, vodka tonic, something strong to, to get it going. Yeah. And then yeah. move into it. Yeah. Dessert has always been the weird spot because you've, you know, you've gone through all these drinks at this point. And it's like, do you, what do you, do you switch to beer? Do you switch to something else? Because generally, you, you know, not now with chill, kids, but back in the day, it was, you know, you have this nice meal that we're going to go out. We're going to go somewhere else. So you were kind of setting up the rest of your evening. Now it's like, that is the pinnacle, you know? So that's right. <laughs> I want to be nice and have something that I really enjoy. And I can, you know, savor the last few minutes of, of freedom of my sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, that's why I love, I love when restaurants have dessert menus. Um, and if they don't, you can always ask your server, what do people get at the end of this kind of meal? Like, what are your special in-house liquors or um, after dinner drinks? that you think would help end our night. Servers are trained especially to ask or to be um, asked these questions. They don't just know the food side of things. They have an alcohol part of their testing too. So use that, you know, stuff that's running around their heads. That's important. And it's a really cool guide because you may end up trying something that you've never had before. And now you add it to your repertoire and it's your new favorite. Right, cool. All right, excellent. So I hope that helps you all next time you, you go out to eat, which is hopefully soon. So something <laughs> that kind of made me think here, trying something you haven't had before. So, yeah, you know, we have places like Total Wine, which is yeah. essentially a grocery store of alcohol. Yes, it is. The wine section. <laughs> I, I, I like I really do use their help there. I love them because. I've had some really, you know, we went out with some friends for a birthday dinner and there's a, a bottle that he loved. So I went to buy some of that for him. And they told me that there's another wine by the same winery. It's just as good. Have him try this. And he loved it. So I would have never known that. So I, when I walk in there, I'm totally lost. And historically, <laughs> that's I'm, why there's signs up, Lee. There's and signs I, I found everywhere. Like a seven or eight dollar bottle of wine from each section just to try it because. As I said, <laughs> isn't it, it's not you know complex enough that I'm going to care at that point. If something's bad, I know it, right? But at least I can get an idea of the style of what kind of what world we're living in, and not feel like I'm losing out if I if I don't you know we're going to get through a seven dollar bottle of wine. I'm not you know it's not going to hurt me. So <laughs> knowing you know some at least some wine knowledge, what what is that trip like for you when you go to a place like that? Like if you don't have something specific in mind and you walk in and you're just you know. 50 sure. of one style. Where, where, where do your eyes go? So for people who don't know a lot about wine, it's, it's set up to kind of ease your mind a little bit, but I know it's scary because there's like signs everywhere. There's signs that are just about grapes. So Cabernet, Chardonnay, there's sections just for those wines, but then there's sections of countries. Um, I go right to France and Spain. Those are my, my favorite two sections of total wine. 
Um, probably because the stuff that um, that I have access to in California is just different and, and a little bit more rare than what you could find at Total Wine. So personally, yeah. me, um, I go to Spain and France. Now, on the East Coast, you guys have a lot more access to the European wines than, say, Texas or California, because you're closer, literally. That's exactly right. why you do have it there. Um, plus, you don't really want to, to be in the market of California wines with a bunch of French wine. People in California drink California wine. That's just how it is. So the European market stays on the East Coast. So that's a really great thing for Total Wines about you guys. Um, I go to France and, and Spain and Spain's, Spain's the one that has all of the really good deals. Um, Garnacha, Tempranillo, these are grapes uh, that come out of Spain that are not overpriced. In fact, they're usually the cheaper ones that you see on the shelf. And that doesn't mean anything except they really aren't very well known in the United States. So we're not gonna overprice them based on a label or a name. So when you see them, and there's one in particular I'm thinking of right now, it's called Las Rocas and it's a Garnacha. Garnacha is Grenache. In case you've not heard of that grape before, it's the same. It's just the Grenache word in, in Spanish. Um, so that one used to be $7 a bottle like 10 years ago. And it was so good. And it was my go-to for like going out Tuesday night with the girls, you know, for, you know, book night. I never did books, book night, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Husbands are out of town, whatever. Um, because it, it was an easy drinker. It's a little on the lighter side and you can do it with snacks. Now, because this is an interesting example, now because everybody knows it and it got rated in a magazine, a wine magazine, it doubled in price. So now it's 14 bucks. So <laughs> what I'm telling you, you're looking at this section, most of these wines are worth more than how they are priced. And so the deals are to be had. So Tempranillo and Garnacha in the Spain section, my go-to all the time. Then go over to France, and for me, I go straight to the bubbles because that's my thing. There are champagnes that are 30 to 40 bucks and there's a lot of them. And those are really easy drinkers. And if you feel like you want to get fancier, the 80 to 100, $150 bottles are there too. One little fun side note, there are very special refrigerators that have the expensive wines in them. But a little known secret is the last of something, let's say they only have one bottle left of this really good bottle that they don't want on the shelf anymore. Maybe it's only 40 bucks. They will put it in that case with those expensive wines just because they don't want to take up that whole shelf where they can restock with something else. Right. So check those really expensive fridges. There's lots, so you can't just get into them. You need a manager to come over. But you will see some less expensive versions, just the last bottle of something in those fridges. Um, I did notice that on my trip um, to the one in Austin recently, but I know they do it in most stores. So you can find good deals over in the big fridge too that's locked. Um, also in France, I'm, I'm a big Rhone girl. So we talked about Shiraz and how much you like Shiraz. In the south of France, uh, Rhone area is Syrah uh, mostly. And so those tend to be my favorites down that way. You can find a lot of Rhone wines. They tend to be blends of Syrah, Grenache, and Morvedra, which are three grapes that are grown in that area. Those tend to be really reasonably priced too. Um, they kind of have the same feel as a Garnacha from Spain. They're kind of a middle of the road um, as far as body goes. They're not a big cab. They're not a light Pinot. They're kind of right in the middle very food friendly and very cost effective. If you don't know what you're doing, you're really not gonna screw up that much if you buy a $15 bottle, so. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So what is, what, if, if you, what, what do you think is a good sweet spot for someone who, who just enjoys wine? Like we enjoy wine, you know, we, we cook, I think really good food. I'm not gonna spend a ton yep. of wine yet. What is a good sweet spot for us? Cost wise, do you think, you know, when we go to the store? Um, so if you're just doing like a, a Tuesday night wine, I call it, um, 25 to 40 bucks is a really nice price point. You can do $7, $8 wines with dinner too, but you can pick anything and, and not care that, you know, you don't like it. Whereas 25 to $40 range, it's usually gonna be a little more noteworthy, at least on the palate. And 
I mean, when you're in Total Wine, you see staff picks, you know, they have the mm. little label under the wine of, you know, Joe likes this wine. I tend to kind of go with those. I know it seems silly, but these people know wine and they picked it for a reason. So it's pretty easy to think that, all right, it's not going to be terrible if the employee that works here likes it. So 25 to 40 for like a pretty casual week dinner, weekends. Gosh, if you go under a hundred, you may be disappointed. And I'm, I'm not kidding. But I won't be. I know that, that <laughs> the, the 80 to dollar 100 dollar price point tends to be that sweet spot at total wine um so if you're talking about you're gonna do filet mignon and you know loaded potatoes and steamed um asparagus and whatever you know all the stuff um that 80 to 100 dollar range tends to be my favorite it just it, it's gonna be more complex usually and you're not gonna be disappointed in how it pairs with your food. You can always do a 25 to $40 wine. You can, you can totally get away with it. But I, I like the weekend, you know, a little, going a little flashy. If you're not going out to dinner, you can spend it on a bottle of wine at home that if it's 80 or hundred in the store, you would have paid two to 250 on a wine list. So. Yeah, okay. Right, so I have one final question and I'm prepared to duck after I ask it. Yeah. Um, so as you know, in Maryland, we cannot buy wine in grocery stores. So right. my current job is located in Virginia. And I went down yeah. and I love Trader Joe's and I stop into Trader Joe's and I see, oh, they have a whole beer and wine section. And I see, yeah. their, I think it's $3.99 wine. Yes. Loaded the cart up because why not, right? So mm -hmm. and I think my, my palate's not refined with wine. I really don't care. It gets us through like a, you know, a Wednesday night. So first, <laughs> how are they doing this? I mean, is it just a, a huge corporation that can subsidize making this cheap wine to get you in the store to buy $8 olives? Right. I mean, okay, kind of. The, there are different ways to grow grapes. And we're going to get to farming just for a second because I'll tell you why. When you're looking at grapes grown in Napa, you're never really going to push the limit of how much fruit you can get from a vine. You want higher quality. So you, you pull the yield back. Wines like that, they are grown on massive farms, all machine harvested, all machine everything. No vines really get touched by humans. And so you can push that yield to be a lot per acre. Okay. The quality is much lower and they're saving on personnel costs by using all machinery. But if you think about if a machine is the only thing touching these things, and, and it is true, um, then all the stuff that's dumped into um, the press when the grapes are dumped in also includes yucky stuff from the vineyard like animals and insects and protein it's protein I'm out of my bottle here <laughs> it's certainly not a vegan selection <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's the difference really does come from the farming side everything in napa is hand touched hand harvested low yield high quality and it is on my vineyard too here so that's the difference that you're getting it's going to it, it may not be terrible. It just won't taste like a whole lot. It would be less complex. And you just have to know that, you know, there were other things that were in that process, like birds and snakes and rodents. <laughs> I, I eat hot dogs. They're really hot dog and a nice sure. Cabernet from Trader Joe's. <laughs> Pretty well stocked. <laughs> okay. All right. Well I, I <laughs> well, I hope you guys have learned something tonight. Um, my glass is almost empty, so I think that moves us on to our next uh, next stage here, which is Let's this. Let's do it. All right. All right. So, so you've not had this kind of wine before, right? No, and and we mentioned it that you know I love. I mean, sour beers are all the rage right now. I've loved sours for a long time. I like them. You know, before the industry went absolutely ape shit with these things, they were just simple, clean <laughs> sour beers. And now people, it's, yep. you know, Oreo cookie, Fruit Loop, you know, Twinkie, Marshmallow, Sours. And it's yep. every flavor under the sun. So I've kind of gotten, I, I just had enough. Like I could feel diabetes coming. So I've scaled back from that. And I've gone to more clean, 
crisp beer lately just to kind of get my path <laughs> back to normal and kind of get the summer weight down. So when you said this would be right up my alley, I was very excited. So if you hold it up to the camera, you can see that there are solids in the bottom. And don't mix it up too much. I'm Do not mixing. I'm keeping those? it still. I'm keeping it still. Okay. So this is the very first method of sparkling wine making. Sorry, mine's fizzing like over the top right now. I'm trying not to make it. All right. Hard. As I said, we're not professionals. What happens, happens. <laughs> oh, shoot. So uh, this is called Petit oh, Natural. Yep, we're going over. Oh, slow down. So I just pop and before, this thing. All right, it's going nuts. Yeah, mine's going nuts. So some of that sediment in the bottom is going to be turned up by the bubbles. And you're going to mm -hmm. see it come up to the top a little bit. Boy, mine's going crazy. Smells good. Yeah. And so how they make this is there are two fermentations that happen um, in sparkling wine. The first one is the yeast eating the sugar to create alcohol. And then the second one is adding a little bit of sugar and yeast back in so that we can create bubbles. When yeast eats sugar, the, bio, the carbon dioxide is the byproduct. And if you capture it in the bottle, this is what happens. So you're getting, you're, basically you're getting little yeast parts. That's fine. <laughs> I think it's, it's always good. <laughs> All these sour beers now is that the industry took off and what they're doing, you know, they're adding a lot of uh, fruit puree at the end. And, and yeah. I, I, I literally had, so I was at a liquor store and you're supposed to keep them cold because you, you want the fermentation. Yes. So I went and I bought a four pack of an orange crust flavored beer that I didn't notice was conditioned this way. And I got it home okay. and I went to open it and it shot me in the chest. I kid you not. I yeah. just sent it to the brewer. Um, and they, Mine is still going over they, you know, they called the store and they said, you know better. You need to keep this, you know, keep this stuff cold. So I think it's a unique way to, to process it. We're never going to drink wine tonight. I know. Mine's still going too. So I just rip the, rip the bandaid off here? I don't know, man. Mine's going everywhere. <laughs> All right. Mine's finally settled down. Mine's finally settled down. You know what? <laughs> I have a popcorn holder. Worst comes to worst. There you go. There you go. So the aromatics that you're smelling are a little bit like sour beer, I think. Um, oh, good. There we go. All right. Perfect. So if you pour really slowly, you'll let that sediment kind of stay in the bottle. And yeah, you're doing it the exact right way. You want the glass to be turned on its side um, so that you don't want a lot of that so the solids. And eventually, yeah, the end of the bottle, you're going to have solids. But this is a little bit hazy, kind of like the beer you're just drinking. And the aromatics, to me, definitely are much more beer-like than wine-like. This, um, And when it's not shaken up, I can actually drink this, and it actually does look like this versus what we have right now. We just I, have I love the look of that. Yeah, that. That, to me, is great. That, that's a sour beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. So the difference between how this was made and how we make champagne or wines that are made in the traditional method is what that's called, is the yeast is removed from the bottle so that we don't have the cloudiness when we open sparkling wine. But yeah. this is an old method. This is the ancient method. Before we learned how to get the, uh, the yeast out of the bottle, this is how everybody drinks sparkling wine. The reason that Texas loves doing these wines, and you'll see them in Virginia too, and now they're starting to do them a little bit in California, is it cuts back on how much the process costs to make it. And there aren't a lot of sparkling wine lines, meaning like bottling lines in Texas. So most of us, if we make sparkling wine in Texas, have to send the wines to Sonoma County. They wow. get processed there and they send it back to us. And if that happens, that's going to double your price on your bottle. So instead of doing that, we're going old school and you're going to start seeing this as something that's coming back around again. It's becoming popular. You're seeing it in California, even though they can get the, the yeast out of the bottle with tons of different bottling lines that help you do that. But um, this is just so fun. It's kind of like the weird beer trends that came back or when gin became famous again, you're like, why is gin popular? That's weird. But what, what goes around comes around. This is a, a really cool method. And these are my grapes. 
So these are two different grapes blended together. And uh, we, one of the grapes is a red one called Sangiovese. And if you've not heard that before, it's what Chianti is made of. So the, the wine Chianti is actually named after the region that it's from, not the grape. The grape is Sangiovese. And then um, our, our buyer, who's Ron Yates, he decided to blend that with our Viognier. And Viognier is a white grape that's really popular in Virginia. So if you go to Virginia wineries, you'll see Viognier everywhere. He put those together and made this into a nice little sparkling wine. So yeah. cheers. Okay, so first thing is this so if you, carbonated. I mean, this, this bottle is still yeah. iron, So I yeah. love that, but it's not to the point where it's taking away from everything else. The flavors that you're getting out of grapes. So these are just two, this basically is two grapes that have been blended and we have this natural carbonation. That's it, right? Because yeah. if you, this was a beer, I would, I would insist that there was like some, like a grapefruit or something, some extra yeah. added to it or brewed with it because this has a sure. citrus profile to it. Yeah. Yeah, the, this is an unusual blend. I can't say there's probably any Sangiovese Viognier blends out there in the world. They, those two grapes don't grow in the same parts of the world normally. Texas, we can grow everything pretty much. So um, those two blended together is weird, but there's a lot of weird blends down here. Um, when he said he was going to do that, we weren't quite sure what, how it was going to turn out, but we are so thrilled. And it was featured in Texas Monthly Magazine this month, the month of June. So we are so mm -hmm. happy. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Well, well deserved because this is this is something that I would replace. You know, this to me is like Saturday afternoon, sitting out under the pergola out back. Yeah. The sun's starting to go down. Let's let's have a couple bottles of this. That's yes. Yes. Now yep. you see a change in the alcohol content because of the natural fermentation? No, because when you're having that second fermentation happening, you're adding sugar back in so the yeast can eat stuff again. So it's not going to change the alcohol content. Um, mostly uh, this process is, is going to stay whatever it is when it starts. I think this one is 19 or sorry, 12.9%. So it's pretty low. Um, my fruit down here isn't usually going to get to the same height of sugar level that maybe California or Virginia can get to. We have so much heat here in July and August that we can't harvest. We can't have stuff sit on the vine into October to make more sugars happen and to make more complexity. Ours comes off mid-July to mid-August. So as far as alcohol content, yes, there are Texas wines that have higher alcohol content. Mine are usually going to be 12, 13, 14 percent just because they're picked before they have that higher sugar content. It's just time. They're ready. It's really hot here. So much like Europe, European wines tend to have a lower alcohol content, too. I don't know if anybody notices that when they drink them, but they have really... They have really cold spells there. And so they can't get those sugar levels because they start later in the season where the sugars are building. So, and there's farming practices that um, can also create differences in, in your alcohol too. But um, I like it for 12.9%. I think it's super yummy. If it had more alcohol, I feel like it would take away some of the nuances that you were talking about. Those really pretty fruit flavors. Mm -hmm. um, now, see, I can see myself getting in trouble with this, with a beer mentality, because if I sit down with a sour, that's right. I'm looking at, that's right. at 16 ounces and I'm looking at about 8%, 7%. <laughs> I would right. have to really limit myself with a bottle of this. Yeah. It goes sideways yeah. really fast. <laughs> I mean, this is this is really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, we love it. We are so thrilled. Um, it's gotten a really great reception at his um, this is at Spicewood Cellars in Spicewood, Texas. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's the it's the wine that they pour right when people show up. Um, as the first wine that everyone tastes in the tasting room and just people are going bananas for it. So we're really happy. Awesome. Well, no, thank you for sending it because this is this is amazing. I may be paying you to send some more up here because this is awesome. <laughs> oh, cool.
Well, all right. Well, this has been awesome. Um, and look, I see her videos had a little bit of a lag. She is literally in the middle of nowhere on a vineyard. So <laughs> we don't seem to be professionals. We're doing our best. We're drinking and we're talking. So apologies if anything doesn't look great, but we are who we are. This is what it is. Um, so anyway, well, hey, this has been great. So I think one's in the books. So well, first, thank you. Cheers for making this happen. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a blast. Um, I love being able to share my knowledge that I've gathered over, it's been almost 15 years now. So I've got a lot in my, in this little brain of mine that, um, you know, I love helping people, especially with the day-to-day -day stuff. The picking out of wines can be really daunting, but it can be easy if you just have a couple set rules. Always ask for help. That's what people are here for. <laughs> yeah. Well, beautiful. Well, we'll keep doing this. Maybe I'll send you some of the beers that I like and we'll do this in reverse. I love it. I and love it. Know football's coming, so I'm sure we'll have some, yeah. uh, some football themed episodes. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think you need to have one of our friends, Andy, on your show that day that we talk about it. I don't think that's a good idea, but <laughs> my, my, my best friend from fifth grade is a Steelers. <laughs> <laughs> we watched our first game together last year ironically it was well no it was two years ago when the Ooh. Steelers were out and the Ravens had nothing to, to win RG3 was in and we decided there's no harm here let's do it so that was the first time in 20 plus years we watched the game together so that might be the last <laughs> so so anyway all right so much for checking in um I'll put all of our social media links down below Please share this. If there's something that you want us to cover or talk about, let us know. We're happy to do it. Um, it's just more drinking for us. So life is good. That's right. So thank you guys so much for watching. And we will see you next time. Take care.